Everybody, welcome back into the stream. Apologies yet again uh, for everything that is currently going on. I, other than having text come out and take a look at everything, there's there's not much else I can tell you guys, but I am working on getting that crap up and getting it running. We had right over 1,200 people hanging out in here with us tonight before everything ended up crapping out. I was talking to myself for a while because I switched over to my backup internet, and right now I am just sticking on my backup internet, and I'm hoping that the upload speed is going to be good enough for you guys. I am kind of tired of all that crap cutting out, so hopefully buffering and everything's working pretty good for you guys, and you're getting a pretty decent feed. Uh, all right, guys, so moving on, all right? We're going to continue to move on with this whole freaking conglomerate over here. So the Iranian airspace, all right? There is a post that has been going around, and I have yet to be able to find the originator of it um, as they're talking about, but it has to do with missile launches that are going to be taking place. Supposedly, one of them is supposed to take place about three hours ago, and it hasn't happened yet from what I've seen. Somebody's telling me to get Starlink. Right now I'm on Verizon 5G um, Wi-Fi. Um, so I, I can't hardline it. I, I apologize, but hopefully it's actually working decent for you guys and you're able to see it. Um, so anyways, these are the rocket launch sites that um, supposedly are taking place over in Iran. Now they are laid out in lat long, as you can see with like the northern and easting that's set up next to them. Problem is I'm really only good with MGRS, not so much lat long. Um, attempted to plug and play a little bit and attempted to actually find the author of this information and who's putting it out there. And we're kind of unable to come up with the author and figure out who it is that actually put that out. But um, the crazy thing about it is that nobody's disproven it yet. Nobody's, nobody's came out and said that it's, it's not actually happening or that there, you know, that wasn't factual. And what it is, is it's essentially a way for them to alert the pilots that are flying over their airspace so that they could create what we used to call a ROS or restricted airspace. So that aircraft don't get taken out by any munitions that are being shot up in the sky. That's essentially what they're saying that these restricted airspaces were set up inside of Iran because of these test launches. Now, Iran is claiming that they are test launches and that there aren't launches on Israel. People are now saying that it's misinformation that's being put out by Iran in order to scare Israelis and to keep them guessing and trying to figure out who who is who is doing what at what time and to keep everybody just kind of hating their lives um, over inside Israel. So there's that. Now, at the same time, we had the U.S. saying that uh, we will back up Israel and our resolve with them is going to be ironclad, that we are going to continue to back Israel on all of this. At the same time we're doing that, Israel yesterday came out and said that if Iran strikes Israel on their territory, that it is potential Israel will strike Iranian nuclear sites. So uranium needs to be refined in order for it to get made into a nuclear weapon. And Iran has been pretty shady uh, in the past when it came to having their nuclear facilities actually inspected. The IAEA actually thinks that Iran could develop a nuclear weapon rather quickly. The international community, when they go out and they talk about this, says that they have enriched their uranium to about the 70% level, and they've only got to take it a couple steps further to get it up to like the, the uranium, I want to say it's 235 level, whatever. They've got to refine it up to that particular uranium level in order to make it into a nuclear warhead or a nuclear weapon. Some people actually believe that they have one developed at this point, but it's just not the uh, best nuclear weapon on the planet. Think all the way back like World War II style nuclear weapon. Today, we're getting much higher yields um, out of everything because technology has advanced that far. So if Iran does have a nuclear weapon, it is rather weak. With that being said, they do have the warheads and the munitions capable of delivering them. Okay. Um, so Israel said that if you strike us on our territory, we're going to go after your nuke sites because the amount of uranium you have doesn't constitute why you guys have so many, you guys have these nuclear power plants, but you don't have enough nuclear power plants online and no nation on this planet needs that much uranium for the amount of freaking, you know, nuclear power plants you guys have. The only plausible explanation is that you're looking at developing nuclear warheads, nuclear bombs and things of that nature. So Iran answered back today and Iran said, if you strike our nuke plants, we will strike yours. And actually said, within 400 seconds of you striking ours, we're going to go after one of yours and actually name the place. They said it will impact within 400 seconds. That's pretty wild and that's pretty brazen for Iran to be able to come back out and state. So with all of that being said, 
uh, the United States military is likely, okay, if they do in fact go into Iran, the United States military is likely going to be accompanying Israel on those bombing runs, right? It's 100%. We've got uh, the SOCOM commander that's going into Israel likely asking in the event that this happens, what do you need from me? He's not going to go in and say, this is what needs to happen. This is how this is going to go down. He's going to go and say, what do you need from me? And hopefully that's exactly what he does. Now, Lufthansa, again, in fact, canceled all of their flights. Like I told you guys, it looked like we have uh, one information from Lufthansa came out that actually kind of confirmed that. But um, they also now, after Lufthansa announced that, you can see flights canceled uh, going from Istanbul into Tehran. Uh, into, uh, Tehran. Um, all of those flights have been canceled at like the last minute because yeah, Lufthansa is worried that their their stuff's going to get blown up, shot out of the sky, targeted, uh, people could get killed. So Lufthansa is worried about it at this point. Uh, the Cuds News Network of all places, which again, sometimes they have decent information, but most of the time they don't. Um, most of the time it's like misinformation, everything else. They also went on the whole spree of uh, Iran's defense minister, ended up shutting down all the airspace. People, again, are still listening and going off on this, so don't pay attention to CUDs, anything like that. The only thing that's actually true when it comes to airspace is the fact that Lufthansa isn't uh, uh, flying anymore inside of there. Uh, moving on just a little bit uh, further down the road. Where did it go? Give me one sec here. So when we move on just a little bit further down and we start looking at this, um, what actually um, they are preparing for and what they believe is going to happen, let me get this up on the map, what they believe is going to happen, they believe that Hezbollah is going to open up with a massive rocket barrage going into Israel in order to overwhelm the Iron Dome. This is like your most likely course of action. Also happens to be, depending on what Iran puts on their warheads, Dangerous course of action on how it goes. Each time your stream fails, I get a ditty from my girl. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that makes me smile, man. All right, so yeah, uh, let's get back. Uh, let's get back over and get back into this. So I ran. Uh, yeah, so Hezbollah starts launching all of these drones and stuff across the border going into Israel, hopefully in that way, overwhelming the Iron Dome, at which point, as the Iron Dome is being overwhelmed, Iran hopefully times it out on their behalf, they hope, they time it out correctly and start sending all of these cruise missiles and rockets over in in order to impact. As all of that's going on, causing all this mass confusion, you would likely then see Hezbollah fighters cross the border and go into northern Israel. If they do that, that's going to be a huge problem for Israel because then that obviously they have enough forces and everything is staged. Um, we saw last week that Israel had actually moved up um, some IDF troops into Haifa all the way up here. It's about an hour's drive from the border and they could have moved up a little bit further. Other than that, we know Israel pulled a good chunk of their troops out of the Gaza Strip and pulled them back out. And while we're on the subject of the Gaza Strip and we're talking about it, remember how I told you guys it was dumb for Israel to pull troops out of Gaza. It tact tactically makes zero sense for them. Uh, it's now being reported inside Khan Yunus that Hamas has retaken Khan Yunus. So Khan Yunus apparently is back under Hamas control since Israel pulled out. There's also reports that the IDF has been bombing Rafah over the last 24 hours. Um, I've seen several people claim it. I haven't seen Israel claim it. I haven't seen anything of that nature, but I have seen civilian videos claiming that that is the IDF bombing Rafah. That could signify that Israel's not playing games and they're about to go in there and go party. Again, all of this this is basically, in my opinion, the Gaza Strip is going to be put on hold until Israel figures out what's going on with Iran. And until Iran attacks or until Israel just says, screw it, you guys have spit out enough rhetoric, we're going to attack you on your home soil. Nothing's going to happen inside Gaza until that goes down. Eid's over. It's done. They're done with it. Ramadan, they're done. Excuse me, not Eid. Ramadan's done with. Okay, so if Israel wants, they can go in there and start slapping on them. They've taken their time. Now, this comes again yesterday, Joe Biden calling for Israel for a unilateral ceasefire. To get you guys up to par, the ceasefire agreement fell through. And the reason the ceasefire agreement fell through inside of Gaza is because Hamas didn't have 40 alive hostages in order to exchange. When we say 45 hostages, we're talking about civilian personnel of women and children and elderly people. They didn't have them. 
and having to exchange back. And Hamas isn't willing to give up grown men to go back in. And some of them are actual soldiers from the IDF. Either way, because all of that fell through and Hamas admits we don't even think we have 40 alive hostages, they're shutting it like they're, they're shutting down the ceasefire talks. Israel is 100% going in. They're not dealing with it anymore. Netanyahu has made numerous statements. And, and that's all the more reason for Hezbollah to go in and attack Israel anyways, because Iran already gave them the green light to do so. So all of this basically spells really bad news for Israel, because not only have they been needing to go into Rafa to get the remaining less than 40 women in jail, like the insanity, over 130 hostages are still in Hamas's custody. A couple months ago, there was presumed to be 100 left alive, and now it's less than 40. So these numbers keep dwindling and they keep going downhill. And the longer Israel sits outside of Rafah and refuses to go in because of pressure from the international community, well, guess what? More hostages are going to die. Israel's had enough. They're going to go in at some point in time. David Brown coming in saying, hey, Matt, I was one of the original kind ban- or, uh Original kind banana. I have only been buying normal support, but I have a question. I have wanted to run by you for a while. David Brown, go right ahead, man. Run me that question by while we're in here. Go for it. Pop it up in the green box, same way you did on this one. Uh, Boner came in gifting out 10 Speak the Truth memberships. Boner, I'm sorry I miss you, man. I love it when you're in here. Totally, totally miss you tonight. So go ahead. Those are all of the things that we have. Okay. The, that is your current situation update on the ground between Israel and and Iran. We have Iran that's making a lot of rhetoric. People are accusing Iran of putting out false information today in order to scare Israelis. And at the same time, we have Israel that has been told by Hamas that they don't have any more hostages to give, essentially, that they will never meet that peace deal or that ceasefire deal because they don't have enough left alive in their opinion. So all of that's bad. All of that is very, very bad. And right now we are just kind of sitting here waiting. I believe like most of the world is sitting around waiting. And I, and, and, and truthfully, I question whether or not a lot of the people in the world actually knows how close to the brink the United States is tonight of getting sucked back into another Middle Eastern conflict. I think most of them think that we're hands off at this point, that we're not dealing with it. And they're going to be caught by surprise should the United States launch an airstrike on Iran in conjunction with Israel. Nemesis says, is Iran really something to fear or just another Iraq? They look like they're powerful, but would be wiped out in a day. No, they're not going to be wiped out in a day, right? Number one, the invasion of Iraq, everything that went on, the thunder runs, all that crap. You had troops that were building up for a very long period of time. So quite literally what we have the ability to project right now, aside from a couple pipe hitters on the ground in order to raise Cain, the, what we have is we have the ability to drop a lot of bombs, Okay, but no amount of bombs being dropped is going to wipe Iran completely out. We can put a pretty good dent in them. We can start taking out some of those nuclear facilities that we're worried about where they're enriching uranium. We can start knocking out all those things, which I'm sure are some of the first targets because it's what the West is really concerned about when it comes to Iran. And now we got a good excuse to go in there and start knocking them out. I'm sure that's one of the things that we'll end up going and doing. However, is it enough to wipe Iran off the map? No, I don't think it is. Uh, Colin F says, Hey Matt, what's the probability the U S gets involved if Iran launches ballistic missiles at Israel percentage wise, I would say hundred percent. Uh, if Iran launches ballistic missiles and it's particularly if one actually detonates inside of a civilian area, you can pretty much guarantee that the U S is going to be conducting joint airstrikes with the IDF or the Israeli air force. Pretty much guaranteed. Um, that will be doing that. Somebody says, nope, and no ground troops for sure in that terrain. Again, totally disagree. I think we'll be launching airstrikes in conjunction with Israel. And the reason I believe that we're going to do that is this is different. Okay, I know we've had, as the United States of America, we've had a very strong stance of not putting boots on the ground inside of the Gaza Strip. This is not what we're talking about. And, and again, some of you guys are, are unaware of this. And so I'm just going to continue to repeat it throughout each podcast and put it up on the screen um, so that you guys can find it. All you got to do to verify this information, if you want, is go over to the old Google box, type in FTO for foreign terrorist organization, IRGC, and then the letters GOV, gov. When you do that, this is going to end up popping up on your screen. Okay. U S department of state foreign terrorist organizations, click on that sucker. And it's going to give you a list of all the designated foreign terrorist organizations. And right here, Oh, where to go you will find the IRGC listed. Uh, where'd they go? 
ISIS, blah, 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 ISIS, 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 Hezbollah, uh, 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 Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. I might have to control F it because I suck at this. Yep, it was right there the whole time, right in front of my face. Since April 15th, 2019, Islam, Islamic, ah, is Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Blew it up on there nice and big for you guys so that you could see it down there at home, okay? The IRGC coming out of Iran. Then if you go down a little bit further and you could actually look, you're going to see... You're going to see the Palestinian Islamic Jihad or the PIJ listed on there as well. October 8th of 1997, the PIJ has been listed on there. So... I do believe that this is going to be different. And the reason I end up saying that's going to be different is because specifically who Israel was targeting inside of the consulate building, specifically that they're enemies of the United States of America. And additionally, they are threatening our key strategic ally in the region. That is a night and day difference between what's taking place in the Gaza Strip, where you have Hamas that sure, they don't like the United States. However, their ability to project onto U.S. military bases, even in Iraq, right? It's pretty much non-existent without the help of the IRGC. And so because Israel took a strong stance against these guys, I do believe that at least the Air Force is going to go and get some along with Israel. Just for the sheer fact that Israel was targeting the IRGC and the PIJ in that airstrike on the consulate, I can see that happening, particularly because, again, the threat that's facing Israel, and I've been telling you guys this since the start of the war, that if Hezbollah crosses the border into Israel, or if they launch a ground assault into Israel, the odds of the United States going in and helping out Israel is pretty damn high. We know that options on the table for Israel. It was offered up at the beginning of the conflict to help defend that northern border. That's why we have aircraft carriers floating over in the Med. That's what it's there for as a deterrent from Hezbollah and Iran. Guess who just entered the picture, ladies and gentlemen? Iran did. Guess who else is going to enter the picture because Iran's on board? Hezbollah. So because of those two things, yes, it is a very high probability that the U.S. actually gets involved in this conflict now. I don't know how else to say that. And if, and if, and if we are going to be using air support in conjunction, close air support, in conjunction with the IDF or Israeli troops up along the border, guess what they're going to need? They're going to need advisors from the U.S. to go along. Now, here's the crazy part about all this, is the CENTCOM commander is going into Israel tomorrow. So CENTCOM commander going into Israel tomorrow. Why do you think the CENTCOM commander is going in there? Think he's going in there to shake hands and show good face? Or do you think potentially he's going in to give them a briefing of all the assets that the United States has made available for them should Iran choose to strike. I want you to think about this. With Iran puffing their chests because the information that came out about the CENTCOM commander going into Israel came out late this evening. At the same time that Iran has been messing around and putting out false information about attacks that are supposed to launch off tonight, the U.S. CENTCOM commander was announced of going into Israel. What do you think that's for? That's for joint coordination. That's exactly what that's for. That's the only thing that that could really be for. And he could discuss it over the phone. He could establish a secure link. He could talk about it that way, but he's not. He's going in on the ground. That is a very big political message, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 21st century. If he wanted, he could make a phone call. He can send an email. He can send a freaking runner. The CENTCOM commander's got a whole area of responsibility. That is not just Israel, but the guy that's in charge of all that crap is going into Israel specifically tomorrow to meet with them. That is a political message that the United States government and the United States military is going to stand behind Israel. Guess what else CENTCOM did yesterday? You guys remember? Again, I'm telling you, if you're paying attention to CENTCOM and you're paying attention to all this other crap, it's pretty obvious. What else did CENTCOM do yesterday, ladies and gentlemen? CENTCOM announced that back in December, we gave a bunch of seized Iranian weapons that were on their way to the Houthis over to Ukraine. Those weapons were seized over the last two years. 
two years of interdiction operations, over 5,000 AKs, sniper rifles, RPGs, lots and lots of guns, and over half a million rounds of AK-47 ammo that we gave to Ukraine that we seized from the terrorists from Iran that were giving them to the terrorists of the Houthis inside Yemen. We stole it all and we gave it to Ukraine. Do you think that's a political message? Serious question. Because it is a political message going from both, okay, going to both Russia and going to Iran. It's a political message for Russia because guess what? Russia has been pumping money into Iran since they've been buying crap off of them for the conflict over in Ukraine or the war inside of Ukraine. All of that money now belongs to Iran. Iran is using this money. It's all going into the same dang pool, essentially, to fund terrorism. So we stole it and we gave it to Ukraine, which would piss off Russia. Because at the end of the day, it's kind of like a circle, you know, money from Russia, go to Iran, try to go to Houthi, U.S. Steel, go to Ukraine, fight Russia. Pretty wild when you think about it. And CENTCOM actually announced that yesterday. So yes, I do believe, easily believe that the United States government, the United States military in particular, will at least be conducting airstrikes alongside Israel if they target Iran. I think Israel can hold their own right now and they don't need us. And that's likely what this meeting is going to be taking place for tomorrow is kind of what, uh, what like the, the point of no return is going to be for the U.S. entering in. Like what is the trigger point? There, Israel would require or need U.S. help. Because you got to remember, too, the U.S. has a lot of different assets. Well, I don't know, Israel might have F 35s, for example. Okay. We also have like fuel, like refueling tankers, all sorts of crap. We've, we've got all sorts of different types of aircraft. We got aircraft that we can launch to jam Iran signals to like take down different, like we've got intelligence. We've got all sorts of stuff, right? That Israel probably doesn't have. And they probably have stuff that we don't have. And that's what they're going to meet. And they're going to talk about, and they're going to determine how they're going to skin this cat and attack Iran. That's what this is about. And it's a political message. So that was a great question. Whoever asked that excellent question, really appreciate you uh, bringing that one up. What else you guys got? I'm, I'm, I'm glad to take those questions and stuff like that. As long as you guys are here, you guys are supporting me. I'm happy to do that stuff. I love this community. No, we, again, we have a great community here on this. I did see somebody before the last stream ended ask me how to get over to the discord. If you want to get in the discord, go over to the community tab. It's going to be the last one, um, but you got to be a true supporter. Okay. If you want to get on the discord and go over that and be part of that discussion, Go over the community tab. If you're a true supporter, you'll see it. It'll say Discord link. You click on that. Go make sure you link your YouTube account so that uh, we know it's you and that you're verified for being in there for, for quite some time. So Sky God coming in, gifting out an additional 10 Speak the Truth memberships. Greatly appreciate you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And H-Town Racing coming in, gifting out another five. Now, the one thing we haven't brought up while we've talked about Iran and we've talked about Hezbollah, we've talked about Israel, we've talked about Hamas, we just talked about the U.S. stealing weapons from the Houthis and giving them to Ukraine back in December and announcing it yesterday for a very good reason. We didn't announce it back then. We did it yesterday, though. Let's talk about the Houthis. Yesterday, the Houthis said that they have over 400,000 troops that they are prepared to send to aid Iran should they need them in order to attack Israel. Now, I highly doubt that they're going to take them up on that offer. <laughs> Boner coming in, dropping 20 Speak the Truth memberships. Don Reed coming in, gifting out another five. You guys are just blessed in the chat tonight. Look at you going. H-Town Racing, Sky God, Boner, freaking Don Reed coming in. Doge Man 88, Dodge Man 88 coming in, becoming a true supporter. You guys are great, man. This is just an awesome thing. So the Houthis, 400,000, all right? 400,000 is what the Houthis pledge that they can give to Iran. Now, likely that's not going to be part of it. If I, what I would believe though, is I believe the Houthis are likely going to get roped in on overwhelming the Iron Dome because they do have munitions capabilities of launching and attacking Israel. They've already done it. They actually shot a ballistic missile at Israel. And for the first time in the history of warfare on planet Earth, a freaking missile was shot down outside of our atmosphere that was being launched at Israel, actually interdicted in space. That happened and it got launched from the Houthis. The Houthis do have a capability of launching things from an extremely far distance. They've also launched other ones that have impacted right either outside of Israel or in Southern Israel in and about the area in the vicinity of the Sinai Peninsula. So they have the capability of doing those things. So likely the Houthis are not gonna be sending in 400,000 ground troops. Oh, let's not forget by the way, 
that they got to deal with Saudi Arabia if they want to actually start marching in that direction. Or maybe, I don't know, they take one of the that cargo ship they stole, put it in the Red Sea, and then sail their freaking 400,000 people all the way up to Israel. But by then, they're just going to get blasted out of the water. So they don't, in my opinion, have a lot of choices when it, when it goes getting into the fight, right? But they do have the ability to help overwhelm the Iron Dome and screw with Israel. That's going to send people into a massive scramble. Mongo Outdoors coming in with two. He says, story on the spike hammer thing behind you. Yep, that's a thing. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, so story of the spike hammer thing. This was uh, uh, presented to me uh, by uh, Ukrainian SOF, uh, SF guys. Um, for the work that I did in Ukraine, uh, myself and the other members of my team all got one before we left. It is an old Cossack, like beat fricking skulls in mace. Um, it's obviously ceremonial. You can tell just by how nicely fricking, you know, just it's beautiful. It really is nice. And I, I don't know where you would even get another one of these. Um, I believe I got a plaque and an award and a couple other things from them as well. I'm supposedly I have another award coming from the uh, Ukrainians as we speak. I got word that it was uh, in the mail the other day. Lord Boosted J coming in, gifting out five Speak the Truth memberships. Brandon Reynolds coming in, becoming a true supporter himself as well. What else you guys got for me on this fine evening? I do believe it's about that time to start taking phone calls. It's getting uh, it's getting up there in time, and I need to give you guys some love. So let's do that. Before we do that, I want to give a quick double check that Israel hasn't been freaking schwacked. Um, and I have a feeling that you guys would tell me in the event that happens. It seems to me like if anything breaks while I'm in here, yeah, uh, you, you guys tend to tell me. So phone number to call in Ian Killian coming in, dropping another 10 speak the truth memberships. You guys are just dropping them memberships tonight. Uh, Will says, to be honest, this is my opinion, getting way too close and really kick off, uh, it hits the fan in world war three, very interesting take. And you're right. How everything they skin this cat scary outcome. No matter how you skin this cat, it is a scary outcome, guys. Um, it's either a scary outcome because Israel is going to end up in conflict with Iran um, or because Hezbollah, let's say that doesn't even happen, likely Hezbollah is finally going to launch their attack against Israel. And again, with or without Iran, with or without this whole consulate deal and Israel looking at bombing Iran, Hezbollah has always been a threat. And Israel is now at the precipice of going into Rafa which is the trigger point for Hezbollah. So you have multiple things that are telling you and stacking up that, hey, Israel and Hezbollah are about to go head to head. Over 100,000 Hezbollah fighters and Israel are about to go head to head. We detailed the amount of munitions that Hezbollah has yesterday. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be a fight. It's not, it's going to, it's going to be, I'm telling you right now, the worst days of this war are yet to come. I, I, I can promise you that with everything in my soul, the worst days of this war are ready to come. And if you're not prepared for it and you're not looking forward, you probably should in my honest gut opinion. Um, that's what I would do if I were you. Phone number to call in, 912-209-4070, 912-209-4070. Love to hear from you guys if you want to chat. Give me a buzz, give me a ring. What up, Canna boy? How you doing there, brother? Yeah, agreed, it's scary, just cause. Everybody, look, this this is not a, this is not gonna be a short-lived ordeal. It's not. This, this is not going to be a quick ordeal. This is not going to be something that's over overnight. Press one to start the call or two to decline. Press one to start. The call will start at the beep. Hello, you're live. Hey, Matt, this is Tom Proxy. What's up, brother? Hey, yeah, so what I was talking about earlier was, uh, if you remember from early on with the uh, war with Ukraine, uh, a lot of people were really frustrated with India and how they refused to, uh, like, condemn uh, Russia. Do you, mm -hmm. you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize that um, the reason why is actually mostly because of um, the oil that they get from, from Russia mm -hmm. and the... Um, they get, I think it was north of nine nine million barrels a day from Russia, mm -hmm. and then um, also because of the events of nineteen seventy two with the war with Pakistan. Interesting. Um, in nineteen seventy two, when they went to war with Pakistan, the United States and the British uh, fought or decided to side with Pakistan, while Russia, and interestingly enough, Israel decided to 
uh, tried with India. Interesting. Well, uh, yeah. So they so this. Go ahead. Was it, I was just going to say, so between those two, that's kind of why, uh, one of the reasons why India kind of walks on a fine line between who they condemn and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I, truthfully, I, I, when was the last time India was relevant in any conflict minus what's, you know, their border disputes and stuff that's going on with Pakistan, and the Taliban, people like that. You know, yeah, yeah, pretty much 1972. <laughs> right. So like, like, I, I don't, I don't mean to like, uh, you know, like belittle India, but, um, uh, is, is anybody losing sleep over this? Like really? So it, it comes into play in the future. If we do go into conflict with, uh, China, because almost all of their, uh, oil, uh, transports right off the coast of India and India could easily shut them down. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So that, that's, that's where it comes into play with trying to keep them on our side, because then we can at least starve them of oil. If war did break out, if India was on our side. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I mean, we'll see truthfully. Um, I think we're a little ways off. I think we definitely have the potential at this point, oh, yeah, particularly yeah. with, the United States last week saying that we're not going to back Taiwan or that we don't support an independent Taiwan. And then China has been, I don't want to say ramping up its rhetoric, but over the last couple of years has definitely increased the military presence in the region has, uh, you know, upfitted a lot of their military bases that have the capability of projecting on Taiwan and all those other things. It is a fear of mine that if we get caught up in another conflict over the Middle East, that Taiwan essentially is going to be a target for China. And, I don't right. think the U S economy or the U S military is strong enough to get involved in another conflict in the middle East and then get in one of the China. I don't think we're there. I think we would have to have a draft overnight. If like the U S wanted to go to war with China, if we're involved in the middle East, I don't think we'd have the ability to project and do, I mean, we, we could duke it out with them for a minute, but like a full on war, I, th- I think we'd have problems. If you picture between yeah, Iraq and like- if you picture between Iraq and Afghanistan, the amount of troops that we had deployed back then, and we had to like stop loss people, hold them in, extend deployments, things like that. Right. And and even that we were still right. kind of hurting. We, and, and we built up the military. Now our numbers are way down and our recruiting is way down. It, it's just not good. Our munitions, most of them are being sent off over into Europe right now or over into Israel. I, I, I just, I worry about our stockpiles. I worry about, our ability to actually fight China, to be honest. Oh, hundred percent. I, I mean, honestly, from, from the way that I'm looking at the world right now, I think, I think America's bleeding the blood in the waters and the enemies are like sharks and they're going to, they're going to swarm it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we'll end up seeing what happens, man. Well, I appreciate you calling in. Yeah, of course. All right, man. Have a good one. All right, you do. Bye. Right, I don't know if you guys heard about the shooting that took place in Philadelphia today at the uh, Eid celebration outside of a mosque. Um, the last thing I saw in it was about four guns had got recovered off the scene and multiple people had been shot. Um, the police officers apparently got in a minor shootout, but I just saw something that said that this whole shooting is going to disappear because it doesn't fit the mainstream narrative. I'm kind of curious what that narrative is. I don't know if you guys are, but I happen to have a video, it looks like, of the police chief telling us what happened. But at 2.30 today, uh, there was an uh, after Ramadan celebration here at at the park. We had about a 1,000 individuals out there, and things were going well. We had a detail uh, assigned to this uh, event, and they were working the outsides. During that time period, they were writing tickets. There was tickets, uh, cars were parking on on the gas station behind us, and they were writing tickets. At some point, they hear a large volley of, of gunfire. They say approximately 30 gunshots. What we do know is there appear to be two factions within the park who are now exchanging gunfire. As the officers start to deploy into the park, they observe three males and a female uh, running, and they stop those individuals, and we recover four weapons. 
At that same time, we have one of our officers who was assigned to the area engage a 15-year-old male who has a weapon. She fires, and that male is, receives a gunshot to his shoulder and his leg. The officer secures that weapon and then transfers that child to the hospital. We have another individual who showed up who's 22 years old. He has a, shot, a gunshot to his stomach, and we believe that may have happened during the gunfire. We also have another juvenile who showed up shortly after, within the last half an hour, at the hospital who has a gunshot wound to his hands. And so, so in, in total, we have five individuals under arrest, four who were carrying weapons, as well as the individual that a police officer uh, fired and, and struck, as well as an uh, individual um, adult. It was a, that's, a, that's the numbers, right? So that's, a, that's the numbers in total. Uh, so that's what we're- Again, five arrested. So we have a total of five, uh, four, three uh, males and a female who were arrested carrying a weapon. And then we have another individual, that's 15 year old, who was uh, shot by our officer. We covered a weapon in that scenario as well for a total of five. Two, two shooting, two shots, wow. Okay. So that pretty much summarized. It sounds like a bunch of juveniles with uh, somebody in their early twenties that were shooting at each other at the end of this Ramadan celebration in Philadelphia. So Highly unlikely you're going to hear anything more about this coming out, but I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to dig into it because I'm really curious um, who were these people that decided to shoot each other? I mean, it's freaking Ramadan for crying out loud. Like, dear God, Eid celebration. Relax, everybody. Are they illegal? I didn't see any of that information getting disclosed. Press one to start. The, the call will start at the beep. Hey, you're live. Hey, what's up, Matt? It's uh, Bones. Bones, what's up, brother? Oh, not much. Um, the reason why I'm calling tonight is because right before I jumped into the podcast, I was watching a news article by the Epoch Times. Yep. And they were talking about how there are states who are passing laws to backdoor the electoral college what these laws would do would pretty much whoever wins the um, popular vote all of these states would give their electoral votes to that candidate regardless of who won the state right yeah i'm pretty sure colorado and, passed that as well like there's i, I believe but, states have actually uh, right passed now it. Yeah, yeah, there's been a bunch of states that have passed that. And right now, as it stands, they have 207 electoral votes. And if they get enough states involved to get them up to 270 electoral votes, then it will go into effect. Interesting. And I... the go on. So along that same line. Okay, I saw something else that people were actually looking at passing legislation so that only U.S. citizens get included on the U.S. Census, which will then take down a massive amount of electoral votes in some locations as well. Excuse me, electoral votes in some locations as well. And, and so they're looking at playing this politics game with electoral votes left and right all over. And of course, that's the right that's pushing that because they believe that there's a bunch of illegals on the U.S. Census. I would tend to believe that as well. And that people are getting you know, yeah. additional power because of that. Yeah. I, but it, it's concerning to me because if enough states fall in line with all the ones that have already passed this, mm -hmm. it would literally turn us into a one-party autocracy. Because it wouldn't matter who won the vote, the majority of states, which if you look at the country, a lot of rural areas vote conservative, mm -hmm. whereas correct. all the major, whereas all the major uh, population centers like the cities and everything all vote Democrat. Correct. So all they'd have to do is just win the major cities. And that's it. it. There would only be them in power. Right. Yeah. Now, I posted the news article in the Discord general chat for whoever wants to take a look at it. 
because they did a lot better of a job explaining it than I am. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for, so what I'm looking for is the voter registration map, particularly of everything you're talking about. Here we go. Found it. Uh, vast majorities of counties uh, showed increased Democratic support in 2018 election. That's a little bit stale, not the one. But yes, I think we've all seen the map of like the United States where it shows pretty much like the entire middle portion of the country is red. And then your states that go along the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans end up being blue with a couple pockets here and there. Again, it boils down to population density. And a lot of your illegal immigrants and stuff are fluxing over to California, New York, all, all over the dang place to these big, highly populated cities because they're sanctuary cities. And if they're being included in the census and they're getting electoral votes because of it, well, probably needs to stop. No, I agree. And I'm not going to be surprised. I, I think... I think what we're seeing right now is only going to be the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're not even in my feelings, remotely close, you know, to people casting their ballots and we already have stuff going on and it's only going to get worse. I, I think our government's about to be in a stalemate and it's, it's bad because we have all these issues going on in the world right now. So, Oh yeah. Dang, Bob, it's good to hear your I've voice. I've seen before. news articles from, yeah, um, I've seen news articles from the Epoch Times talking about how there are election officials in the states that were contested in the 2024 elect or 2020 election, excuse me, who are going to jail for election fraud in the 2022 election. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. There's, um, I, I and, forget, I forget what it was. Cause you know, I've, I've been trying to stay away from the election stuff, um, to the best of my ability. And there was a state that came out you. and brought up, what the hell was it that the machines got hacked? And so there was like 80,000 votes. I think it was that were fraudulent just in like this one County alone. Um, and it was an East coast state. I can't remember which one or what County, but it was just, it's insane. Um, I look at the avian flu thing that's now starting to pop up, right? Like the new bird flu that's floating around the United States. And I think everybody's got mm -hmm. the same fear. Um, especially since who the hell was it? Rob and I talked about the other day, Alex Jones, like, like six months ago came out and said mm -hmm. that that was going to be a thing. And now we see avian flu crap happening. And I think a lot of people like, regardless of whether or not they're conspiracy theorists, it's like, come on, man, it's another election year. And we're going to potentially have a pandemic worse than the spicy flu on our hands. Like really? Yeah. I, 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 right. I don't care what side of the house you fall on. I think there's a lot of people that are going to question that if that happens a lot. I, th I think the majority of Americans are going to look at that so. and be like, fool me once, right? What was it, 10 days or two weeks to freaking... Yeah. Yeah. No. no. I don't think Americans are going to play the game again. All right, brother. Well... <laughs> but it, it's concerning to me... Be it's concerning to me because the threat from within is just as real and maybe even more potent than the threat from without if that makes any sense. 100%. 100%. I, I like our country can be destroyed from within quite easily. From the outside, not so much. From within, for damn sure. Unfortunately. But I know I've already been kicked off the island, so I'm going to go ahead and get <laughs> off and get, let somebody else get a chance. <laughs> You're good, brother. I appreciate you for everything you do for the channel, man. I really do. Good talking to you, Bones. Yeah, not a problem, man. Anytime. All right, brother. I appreciate the channel. Thank you. <laughs> All right, take Good care. Night. Good night. That's always a, like a pleasant surprise when we have guys like that that, that pop in. Like, hey, it's Bones. Like, oh, I know you. I love it when that happens. Let's do an Uno Moss, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do an Uno Moss. And we're pumping. Uno Moss for y'all. Howdy from Australia. Keep it real, everyone, and have a bloody great day. Matt, thanks for being you, mate. No, thank you, friend. Thank Press you. one to start the call or two to the call will start at the beep. Hello, you're live. Hey, Matt. Steph from New York. How's it going? What's up, man? Doing good, brother. Um, just two simple questions. Um, um, I was doing a lot of research on the, the, the fight in Gaza, and, uh, and this um, this new version of the RPG keeps uh, popping up. It's called the Yasin 105. 
Um, and I was curious on your, uh, like, you know, I was curious on your thoughts on it because, like, you know, it's like a, it's a domestic production of a of a new version of a RPG. So it's like a new take on an old thing. And I was curious on your on your opinion on it. So I am looking it up right now. Um, I believe I know the one you're talking about. I want to make sure I got the right one on there. Um, but yeah, domestic production RPG. There we go. Trying to get a good, bam, there it is. Okay. So what do you want to know about it? I'm just curious because, um, you know, they, I think if I'm, if I understand it correctly, there's like, is these two like ignition points and, uh, I'm curious to like, you know, you see these, like these groups, like they, they're taking these, like this old school technology and they're like, uh, they're like revamping it to, and I was, I was wondering to see if if it was effective or, and you know, is it something to be worried about? One, it's, it's not new tech. Okay. It's a heat round, high explosive anti-tank round. And I I try to explain this to, I, I think I've done this, um, quite a while. Um, let me pull it up because I want to get an image because it'll make it a little bit easier to explain. So let me pull up the proper image and then we'll go over it. And pretty much all heat rounds. Here's a traditional RPG seven for how it actually works. Just so people are familiar with it. And it's great because it's got animation that goes along with it. Let me see if I can zoom in on this sucker. It's not allowing me to do it. It's going to make me click on and go view it. One sec, brother. Where did that animation go? Here it is. Please tell me I can blow this up. Yes, I can. Well, kind of. There we go. Okay. Put it up on the screen for people so that they can end up seeing it. So um, I wish I could pause this sucker, but I can't. But it is a great depiction of how this actually works. So what you see up here in like the nose, essentially when that nose gets crushed, um, just like you've got a uh, cigarette lighter, like those long ones that you like uh, click, right? Like any of your clicky cigarette lighters that you click on. It's got something called piezoelectric crystals inside of it. And it creates an electric current and that goes back. Okay. So those are up in the front. So when it gets hit, those crystals get crushed, sends an electric current over here to the back. All of this towards the back of the munition is your actual explosive charge. It's called rear center primed is like the way that this thing is primed to go in and it causes the explosive wave to go forward. Now, everything up in the front, this whole cone is empty. So as that's blasting out, you have your gases and everything that are being compressed by the explosion. Okay, so the gases are compressing everything by the explosion and then drive that forward. So it's nothing but hot gases. Essentially, they're being compressed and pushed forward to get shoved into um, to get shoved into the target to essentially blow a hole through it. Now, a lot of people end up getting these things confused because there is a tiny copper lining. But the reason that tiny copper lining exists is actually to hold the explosives in place. That copper lining, the moment it gets hit by the explosive wave is gone. It's much different than an EFP or an explosively formed projectile that people tend to get these two things confused with. Okay, so that copper lining is completely and totally decimated the moment that explosive wave actually hits it. Um, EFPs have a shit ton of copper in them, um, and the flight on these would be all messed up from it. But again, very old technology. Um, so it's just, it's, so that the Austin is just a regular RPG, or is it just? Is this it's the same thing? Or? It's not that it's the RPG. It's the high explosive anti-tank round or the heat round and the way it's designed. So if, if you look at your screen, they all essentially function the exact same way, okay, where you have that nose cone that's over at the front of the warhead, which is a standoff, okay? Then you have your explosives in the rear, and all it does is it causes those waves to compress the way it's designed to go. You can see a hollow space over here in the back, When this animation finishes, you'll see a hollow space in between the explosives. And what ends up happening is you have those explosives that end up creeping around that hollow space and explosives go 360 degrees equally in all directions. So it's compressing in the middle and it's still being shoved from behind. And that's what's creating that jet to go out. It's that freaking V shape that's cut into the explosives because it's still being propelled forward. And then it's being compressed from the explosives on the side of it as it's being propelled forward, which creates that really, really super hot jet. That just blasts a hole. Gotcha. Hey, thank you. Um, my last question is, you know, like you see these groups now, like they're like producing their own weaponry, and I was curious, like how how much does Iran have control over 
uh, the, the control over them is like as these groups produce their own weapons, the Iranian control of these groups is less and less because uh, you know, like Hamas was considered the least threat and out of like Hezbollah and the Houthis, right? And now you see them like be able to produce certain weapons, like be 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 fighting independently. You think the Iranians have a lot of control of these groups anymore or is or do, are they still like very structured? So I would bet. So things like that round that we just discussed, there's like a mathematic formula into how I actually make that effective. Like the standoff has to be a certain distance depending on the amount of explosives and everything that you have behind. So the fact that they're producing those and have been for the last almost decade now, right? The fact that they're producing those, somebody had to go in and teach them how to make those. Does that make That's sense? A, a revolutionary guard is- Officer, probably, right? Somebody had to teach them how to make those. There's open source information that you can find, but the specific formulas on how to make them work and work well, somebody taught them how to do that. And we know that Iran's been fighting them. It's pretty common sense when it comes to drawing the line. Other thing, too, like some of the explosives that they're using are homemade. And so, likely, again, if you're making explosives, somebody's got to teach you how to do that. It's actually extremely dangerous. It's real basic chemistry, to be perfectly honest with you but it's extremely dangerous. And a lot of people hurt and kill themselves every single year making their own explosives. So somebody taught them how to do that as well. Same thing with the propellant, more than likely. But additionally, the precursors that they use to make those, okay? So all of the different things that they're mixing together into their concoction to make these different weapons, those precursors. Israel knows what those precursors are that you need in order to make that happen. So what do you think they outlawed? And why do you think they control their borders so tight? Yeah, right. It's, so it's, it's, it's the the smuggling, that. the smuggling of the precursors, the knowledge of making it, all of that stuff, all points towards somebody taught them how to do this, and somebody's helping them get what they need in order to make them as well. Yeah, and you think because you think the Iranians have like strong control over these groups, or are they acting more independently? It's because like as like as you gain knowledge, right? You listen less. Is that, is that true or untrue? No. No, because, I mean, they still need money and funding, right? So they still need all that. And that's why Iran has so many proxy forces. That's why Hezbollah is so quick to jump. That's why the Houthis are so quick to jump. They essentially bought their allegiance and have now got them in a position to where if the IRGC was to stop supporting them or if Iran stopped supporting them, they're going to have a lot of problems. And so, yeah, part of it's true. They're going to go operate and do their own independent things. But they're still at the becking call of Iran for the most part. Oh, sure. oh, Matt, I, I appreciate you answering my questions, sir, and uh, I love the show, and God bless. Hey, thanks, brother. God bless. So, that's one of them. Anyways, all right, ladies and gentlemen, hey, I appreciate every single one of you guys that stopped by tonight. If something does pop off over the night, make sure you check back. If not, I'll be back here first thing tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. Unfortunately, my internet appointment for having the text come over and run through and hopefully pull brand new wires and unscrew everything that's going on here in my house is taken care of before tomorrow night. Peace, love, happiness, God bless, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm out of here.